The Ukrainian ambassador addresses the UN. Ukraine requested this meeting on the North Korean troops deploying to Russia, and they're very concerned that they are soon going to be fighting against them in in Ukraine. There's a famine in Sudan, and amid a civil war, humanitarian relief can't get in. Systemic obstruction of local and international humanitarian efforts is at the root of this famine. And when newspapers stop endorsing candidates, is it because of principles or politics? Uh, Well, there are a number of reasons why this seemed to be an extremely impressive and momentous and consequential choice. Today is Thursday, October 31st, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Alexis Strope. And I'm Steve Karish. On Wednesday, Lebanon's prime minister expressed hope that a ceasefire deal with Israel would be announced within days. This as Israel's public broadcaster published what it said was a draft agreement for an initial 60-day truce. The document, which the broadcaster said was a leaked proposal written by Washington, said that Israel would withdraw its forces from Lebanon within the first week of the 60-day ceasefire. <laughs> That's Lebanon's caretaker, Prime Minister Najib Mikati. He says that he didn't believe a deal would be possible until after Tuesday's U.S. election, but that he became more optimistic after speaking on Wednesday with the U.S. envoy for the Middle East, Amos Hochstein, who was due to travel to Israel on Thursday. Mikati told Lebanon's al Jadi television that Hochstein suggested an agreement could be in place before the end of the month and before November 5th. Makati added that we are doing everything we can, and we should remain optimistic that in the coming hours or days, we will have a ceasefire. Hezbollah did not immediately comment on the leaked ceasefire proposal, but the group's new leader, Naim Kasim, said earlier Wednesday that Hezbollah would agree to a ceasefire within certain parameters, but that Israel had so far not agreed to any proposal that could be discussed. From the Middle East to Western Russia, that's where large numbers of North Korean troops are heading in what looks like preparations to join the fight alongside Russia in Ukraine. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin welcomed his South Korean counterpart, Kim Jong-hyun, to the Pentagon Wednesday. VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb reports both defense leaders raised concerns about the approximately 10,000 North Korean forces now deployed to Russia. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and South Korean Defense Minister Kim Jong-un meeting at the Pentagon, both urging North Korea to withdraw some 10,000 of its troops from Russia, with Austin warning of a high likelihood that those troops will join Russia's fight against Ukraine. Here's Defense Secretary Austin. They're doing this because Putin has lost a lot of troops, a lot of troops. And, you know, he has a choice of either getting other people to help him or he can mobilize. And he doesn't want to mobilize because then the people in Russia will begin to understand the extent of his losses, of their losses. Defense Minister Kim. Kim Jong-un didn't didn't hesitate to sell out its young people and troops as cannon father mercenaries. I believe such activities is a war crime that is not only anti-humanitarian, but also anti-peaceful. The United States says a small number of North Korean, or DPRK, troops are already in Russia's Kursk region, where Ukrainian forces launched a surprise attack in August and still hold territory. If the DPRK soldiers are fighting alongside uh, Russian soldiers in this conflict and attacking um, Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers have the right to defend themselves, and they will do that um, with the weapons that we provided and others have provided. Some analysts say Pyongyang's troops represent an escalation of the conflict, but their deployment may not significantly strengthen Russia's hand. Anna Borchevskaya is with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. In a similar sense, when North Korea has provided artillery, it simply provided Russia more of what it already had. And to be sure, that is important, but it doesn't qualitatively change Russia's ability to fight. It simply sustains it. South Korea's defense minister told reporters it was likely that North Korea would seek nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missile technology in exchange for the troops, escalating security threats on the peninsula and across the globe. 
The U.S. and Korea held joint live-fire military exercises Wednesday to demonstrate what the two nations call a commitment to maintaining a strong defense. Carla Babb, VOA News, the Pentagon. And at the United Nations on Wednesday, Sergei Kislitsa, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.N., laid out a detailed account of what the North Korean troops are doing and planning. For more on that, Alexa spoke with Margaret Bashir, VOA's U.N. correspondent. So the Ukrainian ambassador uh, brought to the Security Council uh, new information about North Korean troops with Russians in Ukraine. What exactly did the ambassador bring to the table? What information? Yes, Ukraine requested this meeting on the North Korean troops deploying to Russia, and they're very concerned that they are soon going to be fighting against them in in Ukraine. Um, Ambassador Sergei Kislitsa, who's the Ukrainian ambassador, told uh, the council that according to available information, North Korea's military uh, of about 12,000 troops are being trained at five training grounds in eastern Russia. And he said this includes at least 500 officers from the North Korean army and at least three generals are there with them. And then he went on to say that um, North Korea is planning to make at least uh, five units or formations uh, of two to 3,000 servicemen in each and uh, they will be deploying. And he also said, and we heard this last week, actually, from the South Korean ambassador, that these North Korean troops are going to be sort of disguised and they're going to be wearing Russian uniforms and using Russian weapons. But uh, the key thing is they will be carrying Russian identity papers that will identify them as being from some of the Asian parts of uh, Russia. So in other words, to conceal their identity and try and uh, absorb them into the Russian ranks so they have plausible deniability about them being North Korean. What has the reaction been around the world with world leaders in, in this? I hesitate to call it an escalation since we've known that North Korean troops would be involved with Russia, but this seems to be the most detailed information yet about what the plans are. What has the reaction been? Yeah, well, the South Koreans are definitely calling it an escalation, and they're very concerned. And one of the things they point out is that the troops that go to Ukraine and fight there, this is the first time that North Korean troops will be having real live combat experience since the Korean War in the 1950s. And their concern is the ones that return back to North Korea will be combat experienced, and they could turn that against them or into the, you know, it also destabilizes the further Indo-Pacific region, they're saying. This is their big concern. Also, Japan, which is a Security Council member, also very worried about this, you know, being neighbors. And um, Western nations, European nations in the council, all very concerned about it. I mean, as were all countries to be fair, I mean, whether they were in the region or part of uh, the alliance with Ukraine, uh, you know, South American countries, even China is not happy about this. They're not happy to see their traditional, uh, I wouldn't say ally, but, you know, they're the patron of North Korea. And, and now they're a little concerned to see Russia sort of undercutting them a bit, growing very close with North Korea. So they've not actually uh, you know, they've been very concerned about this development, too, whether they say it explicitly or not. So um, everyone is watching now because this would definitely be an escalation in the war if, if Asian troops come into Ukraine to fight the Ukrainians. Margaret Bashir is VOA's U.N. correspondent. And now to Sudan, where the civil war rages on with no signs of relief for the people trapped in the crossfire. In Umdurman, Sudan's most populous city, community-funded soup kitchens are feeding those in need with little help from the international community. As one part of Sudan faces famine, the world's first in seven years, the U.S. and others have called on the warring sides to allow aid groups to get in. Henry Wilkins reports. When the fighting started in Omdurman, Sudan's most populous city, Ahid Mohammed Ali refused to flee. He said he would rather die in his home than suffer the pain of long-term displacement. Along with other members of the community, they pooled their resources and began cooking and sharing meals for those who remained in the city. Because we have very few resources, we created a WhatsApp group and a Facebook page. We also have TikTok and started trying to spread awareness of what we were doing. Then we started receiving donations from the Sudanese diaspora abroad. With the city's economy in a state of collapse since Sudan's war started in April 2023, Ali says his makeshift soup kitchen now feeds 200 families every day thanks to private donations. 
others like it, have sprung up across the city, with almost no support from international aid groups. An October statement by 11 of the world's biggest humanitarian donors, including USAID, says both sides in the conflict are obstructing aid groups' access to cities like Omdurman. It says systemic obstruction of local and international humanitarian efforts is at the root of this famine. One part of Sudan is undergoing the world's first famine in seven years, while large swathes of the country are one step away from falling into famine. In an interview with VOA, Sudan's finance minister said aid groups are being given all the access they need. Yes, of course they have the access. Uh, the, the, you, you can talk to them. And uh, actually and no one has uh, uh, obstructed their movements around. VOA spoke to Refugees International, an advocacy group for displaced people that partners with various international aid groups. Daniel Sullivan is director for Africa, Asia and the Middle East at the organization. To, to claim that um, international NGOs and UN agencies have all the access they need is, is blatantly false. Um, I've spoken to many uh, partner groups that are working on the ground and whether it's the direct blatant blocking of aid um, or the slow rolling of visas and, and other bureaucratic impediments, um, clearly people who are working on the ground do not feel that they have the access they need. And the opposing side in Sudan's conflict, the Rapid Support Forces, did not respond to a request for comment. UN experts have said that due to the lack of access for traditional aid groups, soup kitchens like Ali's are leading the way for the delivery of food aid in Sudan. But Ali says aid groups need to help. I ask God Almighty to help us reach international aid groups. Reaching these organizations is very important. He says he's only able to serve one meal a day for those who arrive on his doorstep. Henry Wilkins, VOA News, Omdurman, Sudan. And here are some other stories we're following from around the world. Authorities say flash floods in Spain have killed at least 95 people, turned village streets into rivers, ruined homes, and disrupted transportation. Floods of muddy water tumbled vehicles down streets at high speeds. Police and rescue services used helicopters to lift people from their homes and rubber boats to rescue drivers stranded atop their cars. The prosecutor's office in Georgia says it's launched an investigation into alleged vote rigging in last weekend's parliamentary election, which officials said was won by the ruling party, but the opposition say was illegitimate. The opposition immediately raised objections that the prosecutor's office would not conduct an independent investigation because his head is pointed by parliament, which is dominated by the ruling party. The UN General Assembly has voted overwhelmingly to condemn the American economic embargo of Cuba for a 32nd year after Cuba's foreign minister strongly criticized the Biden administration and expressed hope a new U.S. president would end it. VOA's International Edition continues. I'm Steve Karish. And I'm Alexis Strope. Time now for our daily foray into American politics. The two candidates for U.S. president are making what they call their closing arguments to voters in this final week before the election. VOA senior Washington correspondent Carolyn Prasuti has the story. In this final week, the presidential campaigns take on the air of a court case. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? These are closing arguments, with voters acting as the jury until Tuesday. Former President Donald Trump making his case about the economy and immigration in Madison Square Garden, the epicenter of New York City. Kamala Harris has shattered our middle class after years of building up foreign nations, defending foreign borders and protecting foreign lands. We are finally going to build up our country, defend our borders and protect our citizens. It's called America First. The 20,000-seat arena was packed. Some voters waited overnight to get in. It'd be kind of cool to have a role model, but honestly, I think Trump will do a really good job with the administration and with foreign affairs. He's outspoken, he's unscripted, and he resonates with me. I really see that Trump is going gonna, is gonna to take us to, to the next level. For her rebuttal, Vice President Kamala Harris chose the ellipse in Washington with the backdrop of the White House, the future home for one of the presidential contenders. 
It is time for a new generation of leadership in America. Harris laid out her own vision for America, seeking to strike a contrast with Trump. It is time to turn the page on the drama and the conflict. I will enact the first ever federal ban on price gouging on groceries. Cap the price of insulin and limit out-of-pocket prescription costs for all Americans. Again, tens of thousands attended. The first woman president, I would love to see that in my lifespan. I am a gay man, and me personally, I like to keep my rights. She says she supports abortion rights, um, pro-choice, um, a woman's right to choose, and I believe that she will ensure that there is not a national abortion ban enacted under her presidency. Given how close the race is, the election may be too close to call on Tuesday night. Lawsuits are already underway in some states over ballot counting and voter eligibility. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News on the Ellipse. The Los Angeles Times and Washington Post announced last week that they would not be endorsing a candidate for president. Many saw this as the newspaper's owners backing down and avoiding a confrontation with Republican nominee Donald Trump to protect their business interests. But why do we even have endorsements when we want objective journalism anyway? I speak with Ed Wasserman, professor at the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California at Berkeley. Last week, both the L.A. Times and the Washington Post made the controversial decision to not endorse a candidate for president. It's something that both papers had been doing for a long time. They decided not to. Why is this decision seen as controversial? Uh, well, there are a number of reasons why this seemed to be an extremely impressive and momentous and consequential choice. Now, much of the focus was on the Washington Post because the Washington Post has a unique place in the constellation of American news media, uh, really deriving from its what's viewed as a very heroic uh, action that it took in helping to unseat uh, President Richard Nixon over Watergate. Uh, and, and of course, the, the ownership change in the Post when it went from being a family-owned paper, which it had been for generations, to being bought by one of the very richest people in the world, Jeff Bezos, in, I believe, 2013, um, there was a lot of concern that some of its uh, journalistic bravado and some of its determination and some of its stature would be lost if Bezos was to allow his broader range of business interests to somehow uh, moderate or temper uh, the Post's commitment to quality journalism. Well, the, so, the accusation the, is that that's exactly what's happening, that because of Bezos's other business interests, he's not letting the paper endorse a candidate that might be harmful to them. That's exactly right. That is the concern. And when you look at the range of Bezos's uh, business entanglements, his economic interest through Amazon and many, many other com companies, uh, it's very hard to see anything uh, that any area of public policy, of potential legislation, of potential regulation that would not uh, uh, impinge on his activities. Uh, so he has a, a huge range of exposure to adverse actions coming from the federal government. And, uh, and certainly Donald Trump has uh, distinguished himself by uh, very kind of reckless and heedless and uh, oftentimes violent uh, rhetoric directed at the press. So uh, Trump is an unusually dangerous person if you are a Jeff Bezos with billions of dollars at stake and a lot of stockholders who are not sort of eager to see him unleashing the Washington Post to tweak continually tweak a Donald Trump uh, in a way that could be um, could be harmful to his business interests. So the controversy is that the Washington Post appeared to be set to endorse Kamala Harris for president. Jeff Bezos yes. put a stop to that. And the fear is that he's allowing his other business considerations to impede the journalism of the Washington Post. But what place does a 
endorsement have when we expect journalists to be, quote unquote, objective anyhow? Well, that, that's a great question. And it goes to sort of the tradition of press in the United States, which is it is a it is a tension between the press being an advocate and being a, a clear eyed proponent of certain policies that it deems independently deems to be sensible and being a good faith provider of news uh, uh, impartial news told down the middle in a way that sometimes reflects badly on the very issues that the editorial page might favor. Um, and you have this tension because, in part, uh, traditionally, the editorial page was the place where the publisher had his, normally, his say. Uh, in other words, and the publisher meaning the ownership of the paper. That was the place where the owners of the paper could say what they really think and they really want. And they were meant to stay in their cage. They were meant to have that place to opine and to advocate and be as crazy as they want. Independently of what the news side was doing, the news side was supposed to be composed of journalists who generally didn't like the publisher – oftentimes didn't agree with the publisher, but were free to go ahead and do their journalism. So that traditional distinction between what the owner, the owner gets their say in the editorial page, the journalists independently of that do what they do on the news side is something that news people understand, although many people in the public do not. Uh, and, and yeah. Why is it that endorsements uh, from newspapers have become the norm, but not radio stations or TV stations. You know, uh, that goes back to the, the realities that news uh, broadcasting has always been regulated. And broadcasting uh, has been under the 1932 legislation. Uh, broadcasters were not supposed to broadcast opinions. For a long time, there was something called the fairness doctrine that if you had people on, say, television or radio expressing an opinion, the license holder, meaning the station, had to provide equal time for people who oppose those opinions. Bear in mind now, at least in radio, uh, there is space for opinion journalism and opinion making, and that's why you have talk radio now, which flourished after the Fairness Doctrine was repealed. So it's not entirely the case that you don't have opinion making on uh, the, the TV and radio, but I think for the most part, uh, TV has avoided it because they, opinion making doesn't necessarily win you friends. So from a sheerly commercial point of view, uh, and I think that even the newspapers that routinely endorse candidates find this, from a sheerly commercial point of view, if you could keep away from opinion, from proffering opinion, you'd probably be better off in terms of retaining a more or less happy audience. So is it possible that that's the conclusion Jeff Bezos came to? He just did it at an inconvenient time? No, I I think that if he really was opposed to the post taking a position of presidential candidates, he should have done it six months ago or 12 months ago rather than two weeks before the election, which looks very much like he's taking the knee because he doesn't want to anger Trump. Um, and let's, let me also just point out. Which is not uh, not trivial that the post is going to continue to endorse candidates for lesser offices. So the very campaigns where its opinion is most likely to have an effect on voter behavior, which are these little campaigns for local offices or perhaps even congressional candidates where voters don't haven't made up their minds and don't know what to think. The very can those very campaigns, the post is going to continue to express influence, try to influence. So it's not as if the notion of a newspaper exercising influence is something that Bezos is turning away from. He just doesn't want to do it on a presidential level, and it's impossible to resist the conclusion he just does not want to anger Donald Trump. Edward Wasserman is a professor of journalism at the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California in Berkeley. Professor Wasserman, thanks for your analysis today. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. 
And that'll do it for us today. This has been International Edition on The Voice of America. On behalf of everyone at VOA, thank you for joining us. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. From Washington, I'm Alexis Strope. And I'm Steve Karish. Thanks for listening.